NASA is about to launch a new exoplanet hunting mission into space called TESS. In this video, we're going to break down what TESS is all about, so stay tuned. Hey Cool Worlds, it's David. Here at the Cool Worlds Lab, we are celebrating the imminent launch of NASA's TESS mission. That's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Tess. This is NASA's next planet hunting space based mission, so it's a big deal for people like us here at the Core Worlds Lab. And it is due to launch at 6 32 pm Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral, Florida on Monday. So, certainly, we're not expecting to see test data you know, as soon as next week or anything because it has to get into its orbit, there has to be a commissioning phase and calibration of the telescope. But this year, hopefully, we might be seeing the discovery of new TESS planets. All right, so let's get into a little bit of the details of how TESS is going to work and what it's really doing out there. Many of our regular viewers will be familiar with the Kepler mission because, you know, we talk about it all the time on this channel, and the transit method. And this is the same method that TESS will be using to try and look for planets as well. So what is a transit? Well, really easy. It's just an eclipse. It's when a planet passes in front of another star, and as it passes in front, it blocks out some of the light for a short amount of time. So we can tell there's a planet there, not because we can see the planet directly, but because we see that star dim in a characteristic way, which tells us there's a planet there. Okay, so since 2009, Kepler's previous exoplanet hunting mission called Kepler did exactly that, and it found thousands of new transiting planets. It was a real revolution for us. So, what is the difference between Kepler and TESS, you might be asking yourself? The answer is that it's all about brightness. Kepler, at its heart, was a statistical mission, which means that its primary objective was not just to discover planets for the hell of it, it was to discover planets to count up how often are there Jupiter-sized planets around Sun-like stars, or Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. And in the case of Earth-like planets in particular, you really have to wait a long time to see that planet pass in front of its star. I mean, think about the Earth. The Earth goes around the Sun once every 365 days. So if an alien observing the solar system wanted to detect several transits of the Earth in front of the Sun, they'd have to stare at the same stars for at least three or four years, and that is what Kepler did. Now, any camera, including this camera I'm on right now, has a finite field of view. And so, if Kepler's going to stare at the same stars all of the time, it can't stare at the whole sky, it can only stare at a finite portion of the sky. And so, although we now know of many thousands of exoplanets, the vast majority of them, thanks to Kepler's success, happen to live in the same part of the sky. And that's not coincidence, that's just because that's where Kepler looked. So if you just look at one patch of the sky all the time, you're going to have maybe a handful of very bright stars, but the vast majority of them, of course, will be far away and thus pretty faint. So what if you wanted to find lots of planets around not just faint stars, but lots and lots of bright stars? How would you do that? Well, this is what TESS is all about. Rather than looking at a single patch of the sky all the time, TESS will shift and stare. It will move around the sky so it can monitor every patch over its two-year mission. So in every individual patch that it looks at, there might only be a few dozen very bright stars, but by looking at the entire sky, all of the patches across the sky, it will hopefully find many, many planets around many of these bright stars. Now, you're probably now wondering, like, why are we so obsessed with bright stars? What's the big deal about that anyway? Great question. Astronomers, turns out, really like bright stars. And it's not just for the fun of that you can see it with the naked eye, perhaps. It's actually because they're much easier to characterize with telescopes such as the James Webb Space Telescope coming up soon, and also to measure the mass using ground-based telescopes. So in other words, if you have planets around faint stars, that's good and interesting, but you can't really learn much more about them. You just really know their size and their orbital period. But if you have a planet around a bright star, 
we can use other telescopes here on Earth and in space to characterize that planet further, to learn about its atmosphere, to measure its mass, and maybe even much more than that. Now, there's no such thing as a free lunch, so if you're gonna survey the full sky, there's gonna be a compromise somewhere in your ability to detect planets. And the compromise that TESS makes is that it is not as sensitive to planets at very long orbital periods. The way TESS will work is that it will survey each patch of the sky for about a month. TESS is actually made up of four cameras which go all the way from the ecliptic all the way up to the pole. So these four cameras scan across every month and eventually tile the entire northern hemisphere. So after 12 shifts or 12 months a year, it has surveyed one entire hemisphere of the sky after that point, it flips itself over and starts looking at the southern hemisphere of the sky. So the idea is then by year two, you have surveyed the entire sky for transiting planets. There's a few important technical differences between TESS and Kepler. For one, Kepler was in an Earth trailing orbit. So it actually orbited the sun just sort of lagging behind the Earth whereas TESS will be in orbit of the Earth. But it's a very unusual orbit, actually. It's gonna be in a two to one resonance with the moon. Okay, so what's the advantage of that? Well, it helps the spacecraft with its orbital stability. TESS is in an elliptical orbit around the Earth, which means it swings in very close and then it passes wide out. So when it makes these close perigee passages to the Earth, we get a very high data downlink, so we can download all the data off the spacecraft at very high fidelity. And then when it's far away from the Earth, that's great, you're not gonna get disturbed by, say, the Van Allen belts around the Earth. There's no interference. But an eccentric orbit is not stable. The Earth's quadrupole moments and torques and tidal effects should destabilize that orbit over time. So this is where the moon comes in. If you keep the spacecraft in precisely a two to one resonance with the moon, the moon actually stabilizes that orbit. So it is thought that this orbit should be stable for maybe a decade. So yes, whilst TESS is planned to be at least a two year mission, it could go much, much longer. And actually as someone who is interested in monitoring planets for a very long period of time to look for moons and rings and things, that is the part of the mission which really excites me. Another difference is the optics. The telescope of TESS itself is quite different to that of Kepler. The diameter of the Kepler telescope was about a meter across, so it could collect a lot of light, and it needed to do that because it was typically looking at stars which were very, very faint, from which there wasn't very many photons. TESS doesn't need to do that because it's primarily interested in bright stars, so the size of the individual telescopes, remember there's actually four of them on board the spacecraft, are much smaller. They're about 10 times smaller. Another subtle difference is the filter that TESS will monitor stars through. So Kepler was a broad band pass, more or less a visible filter. It could see more or less the same kind of light that comes into your eyes, whereas TESS is a bit more focused towards the red end of the spectrum. There's a few reasons for this, but one I think of the primary reasons is that we're becoming increasingly interested in searching for planets around red dwarfs, M dwarf stars, because they're smaller and we have an easier job trying to measure their atmospheres compared to bulkier sun-like stars. So by optimizing the camera to look at red light, that's the peak wavelength of light from these small M dwarf stars, it's gonna make the telescope's job a little bit easier when it tries to search for planets. Because of the smaller size of the spacecraft and the fact it's in a Earth orbit rather than an Earth trailing orbit, the costs are smaller than that of Kepler. Kepler was something like a $600 million to build and then the launch costs on top of that. Uh, TESS is something more like $200 million for the actual bill costs, and I think the launch is something like $87 million on the Falcon 9. So this is much, much cheaper than, say, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was like a couple of billion dollars, or the James Webb Space Telescope, which is, you know, approaching $10 billion now. This is a cheap and cheerful telescope that hopefully, regardless of its cheap cost, will find many, many exoplanets for us. So let's put some numbers on that, sort of how many planets will tests actually discover? Well, thanks to the Kepler statistics, we can actually make a pretty good guess about that. And the number is something like 2,000 new transiting planets. Now, those planets will be orbiting the 200,000 primary targets of the TESS mission. Those are the targets which it will essentially take a photograph of once every two minutes. But what's really cool about TESS is that because of its unique orbit and the fact it gets to have this high data downlink compared to that of Kepler, it will be able to take a photograph of the entire sky 
once every 30 minutes and send that back to the Earth. So we call those full frame images. Amongst these full frame images, there are far more stars visible to test. Now these are gonna be fainter stars, but potentially we could discover many, many more thousands of planets around those fainter stars. So to finish off this video, I'm gonna sort of talk about my own personal connection to the mission. I'm not involved in the mission anyway, but I am certainly very excited about the prospect of these thousands of new transiting planets. I think what excites me the most though is the possibility of an extended TESS mission. Now that's because each of these fields that TESS will monitor will typically only be monitored for 27 days. There is some overlap on the poll actually where it will get almost a year's worth of data but even a year's worth of continuous data that's not enough to discover, you know, Jupiter-like planets beyond the snow line of their stars. Those are exactly the sorts of planets that Alex Tichy and I have been sort of homing in on recently as the most likely place where we might find exomoons in the future. And an extended TESS mission could find those types of planets as well. So we might imagine testing something like twisting over completely onto the pole and just rotating on that pole and getting continuous data, maybe, who knows, for like eight years or something. That would be my dream. I, I don't know if it's everybody's dream, but that would certainly be my dream for an extended mission. We would find lots of these cold Jupiter-like planets and it's where I'm very optimistic we will be able to find exomoons using, say, Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope. Maybe not with TESS itself, but it would certainly find the planets which we need to find the moons. So that's my take on the TESS mission. Um, give me your thoughts about whether you're excited and what you're excited about with the TESS mission. Of course, at the same time, the Kepler mission is kind of coming into its death throes right now. It's really on its last legs in terms of the using up the final bits of fuel left in the tank. So to celebrate that, I'm trying to arrange uh, for Natalie Batala, who is the mission scientist for Kepler, to visit us here at the Coolwards Lab and have a drawn out conversation about the legacy of Kepler and how Kepler changed over the years. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask Natalie, uh, make sure you put them down in the comment section below and I'll be sure to pass them along and maybe we can get through them in the video. So. Fingers, toes, everything crossed. I can't even do these fingers. Here we go. Fingers crossed, toes. Everything crossed for Tess on Monday. I'm sure everything will be fine. Falcon 9 has a really good track record, but I'm sure lots of astronomers nevertheless will be sort of holding their breath and a little bit uh, nervous around the launch, but um, we'll be having a little party here at Columbia to celebrate. We're live streaming it. Unfortunately, I couldn't go there myself but we'll be live streaming with some beers nonetheless so i hope you enjoy the launch i'll put a link down below for where you can actually live stream it yourself if you want to check it out and uh, thank you so much for watching everybody and until the next video stay thoughtful and stay curious <laughs>